Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Security in the 21st Century. I'm Suzanne Loftus, and I have with me on the show today, Dr. Lilia Arkelian. Lilia, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here, Susan. Thank you for inviting me. Lilia is a adjunct professor of politics and international relations at Florida International University. She's also a research fellow at the European and Eurasian Studies Center at FIU. In addition, she is an international consultant for the United Nations Development Program. So Lilia specializes uh, in the former Soviet Union and in ethnic national conflicts in Eurasia and the Caucasus. And more recently, there's been um, an eruption of violence in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. And Lilia, uh, being an expert in this uh, region and in these topics, uh, has written an interesting and fascinating article about it. And I thought that we could talk about this conflict today. So Lilia, could you tell us a bit about the history of this conflict? Where is Nagorno-Karabakh and why has it been called a frozen conflict since uh, the 1990s, I believe? Yes, so Nagorno-Karabakh is located in the South Caucasus. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was a part of the Azerbaijan Republic. It calls the autonomous, um, the autonomous oblast of Nagorno-Karabakh. But I would like just mention really briefly so our viewers will understand a brief history of this region is that at different parts of history, these three states, the South Caucasian states, which are Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, they were part of the three empires, uh, which is the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Persian Empire. So um, I would like also to mention that Nagorno-Karabakh at one point was an independent entity within the Russian Empire. We are talking about the 19th century. When the Soviet Union was formed and it was in 1920s after the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, uh, Joseph Stalin, he gave Nagorno-Karabakh um, to Azerbaijan as part of the divide and conquer, divide and rule policy of the Soviet government. But it's very important to mention the Nagorno-Karabakh population was a majority were Armenians. Of course, people were unhappy. So when in 1985, Gorbachev came to, um, came to office and he declared the policy of perestroika and glasness. Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh, they declared independence. Of course, they held the referendum and the majority of people, they decided that um, they wanna not only to be independent, but they, they want to be a part of Armenia. We are talking about the Republic of Armenia. Of course, Azerbaijanis were unhappy. They considered this referendum to be un, un, um, illegal. And the war uh, and uh, the war actually started in the 1990s. The war lasted for four years. Uh, there was a ceasefire agreement signed in 1994, which didn't lead um, to peace treaty. This is something that I want you to keep in mind because this is very important in international law. Since far, it doesn't mean that there, it, it doesn't mean that automatically there is a peace treaty. So basically what happened since 1994, this conflict was considered to be a frozen conflict because there weren't a resolution of this conflict. Um, uh, we had the means, we still have the means group, which is a only legal entity that is handling this conflict. And there are three co-chairs, Russia, the Soviet, uh, the United States, and France. So during all these 30 years that this conflict was frozen, um, the co-chairs of the Minsk Group, they tried to come up with the security framework for this, for this conflict, but they could not. Why? Because each state that was involved in negotiations, they all have different interests. For Russia, for instance, for Russia, it was uh, very important to have this conflict as frozen because, you know, by having both states, Armenia and Azerbaijan, relying on Russia and buying arms from Russia, Russia actually um, extended its, its control over the region. For the United States, the United States was mainly interested in energy projects with oil-rich Azerbaijan. And for France, 
um, which is a part of the European Union. Again, the European Union established the Eastern um, Partnership Initiative that include the countries of the former Soviet Union, which are Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine. But as we could see, this initiative was also mainly focused on bringing gas and oil to, uh, to Europe from the Caspian Sea. So that's why we call this conflict as a frozen conflict because since 1994, there wasn't actually a resolution to this conflict. There were a couple of um, initiative that I would like to mention. The first one, it was the Madrid principles, which, um, which required for Armenia to give up the seven um, so-called buffer zone, which are not uh, original, a part of Nagorno-Karabakh, but they are basically the territories of Azerbaijan, which are actually, you know, um, located in the area. So the Armenians call it the buffer zone. So the Madrid uh, principle required Armenia to give up the seven territories in, change, in exchange of to recognize the Nagorno-Karabakh as an independent entity. It didn't happen because uh, when the first president of Armenia, Levonter Petrosyan, who was actually um, the supporter of this initiative, and he decided to give the seven regions of that we are talking about the buffer zone to Azerbaijan in return of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. There were protests in Armenia and he had to actually step down. So every, every president that uh, ruled Armenia after that, he had to, and I'm talking about uh, Robert Kocharan and Sir, Sir Sarkisyan, they had to make sure that uh, they are not giving up any territories because this topic was very sensitive for Armenians. But this topic was also very sensitive for Azerbaijan, right? Because basically they lost... Um, not only Nagorno-Karabakh, but seven, uh, um, seven, you know, like um, the buffer zone that I'm talking about. So that's why uh, over the last 24, 26 years, this, this company was considered as a frozen. Oh my gosh, Lilia, that sounds so complicated, but thank you for explaining that to everyone. Now we have a better idea where this uh, region is and uh, why, uh, why it's so intricate. Um, but recently, over the summer, we've heard all about Nagorno-Karabakh, it's been all over the news, violence has erupted there once again, and it became a hot war again. And could you tell us a bit what happened and what's going on there? On September 27, Azerbaijan launched an attack on Nagorno-Karabakh. This time it was actually a full-scale war, because if before there were the outbreak of violence between Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh, and I'm talking about the four-day four day war in April 2016. This time it was different between, uh, because first of all, um, Azerbaijan used the modern technology. It was uh, the so-called the fifth generation of war. Azerbaijan was supported by Turkey, and I'm talking about military support, I'm talking about logistic, um, I'm talking about financial support, and Azerbaijan was also supported by terrorist groups that were brought from Syria, Libya, and um, also foreign fighters from Pakistan and Ukraine. So the war lasted for 45 days. And I would like to, to mention that uh, this time Azerbaijan military was um, very strong because during the last 10 years, Azerbaijan spent um, around um, $24 billion on its military budget. On the other side, Ar Armenia decreased its military budget in 2019. So this time Azerbaijan used the manless drones. It, um, it used, you know, all the modern weapons. And of course it was really difficult because Nagorno-Karabakh didn't have this, this type of equipment. So what happened um, after 45 days of fighting and thousands of people dead on both sides, Russia brokered a deal, um, the so-called ceasefire that was signed on November 9, 2020, 2020 by three parts, Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. 
Armenian people were, were not happy because the large part of Nagorno-Karabakh actually was given to Azerbaijan. And Nagorno-Karabakh ended up uh, to have just a capital of Nagorno-Karabakh, Stepanakir, and a couple of villages. So we're talking about 12,000 kilometers of original Nagorno-Karabakh that became now 2,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. And um, so Russia, you mentioned, is implicated in this and is brokering a so-called uh, peace deal. But so far, it's only a ceasefire. Is that right? There's not actually a, a peace deal achieved. And um, the conflict seems like it's far from over based on what you described. Uh, so do you think that this deal maybe perhaps uh, would worsen the situation on the long term and that we're, we're, we should expect to see something uh, erupt there very soon? Yes, Susan, it's a very good question, actually. Yes, I do think that in the in the future, we are going to see the new outbreak of this conflict because of the following reasons. First of all, if Turkey before wasn't a key player in the conflict, Turkey is not a member of the Minsk group, Turkey wasn't involved in this conflict, yes, it did support Azerbaijan, but only it provided actually, let's call it moral support. But this time, Turkey is involved. And even though uh, Russia was the one who sent peace um, keeping forces to the region, right? But in the meantime, then President Aliyev actually announced that Turkey is also going to have peace forces. Um, President Putin uh, said that is not going, is going to be on the territory of Azerbaijan. Okay. So if uh, the territory of Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh, according to international law, considered to be the territory of Azerbaijan, it is said to suggest that Turkey can have its peace forces, let's say, in Shushri, which now is a part of Azerbaijan, right? So right now we have not only Russia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, but we also have the Turkish involvement in this conflict. Second. The second reason that I think that this, this ceasefire is actually going to be break is going to be violated is because of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. If before we think the misgroup framework. Uh, the co-chairs, they actually offered to give up these seven lands that we are, we've been talking about in return to the status of Nagorno-Karabakh right now. There is no conversation about the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Even more, uh, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, he announced that uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh will be decided by the population of Nagorno-Karabakh. But let me, let me make it clear. If right now Azerbaijan, you know, regain the territory, which means that the Azerbaijani people are going to come back to Nagorno-Karabakh, right? Who is going to decide the status of Nagorno-Karabakh? Armenians? No. Is there going to be Armenians and Azerbaijanis, which right now actually consider to be the majority of Nagorno-Karabakh? So of course the Lavrov's words are also doesn't hold water. Then. Why do I think that um, this, this is going to be, this ceasefire is going to be um, violated? Because of the Russia uh, and Turkish relation. First of all, Russia sent these peacefire, uh, peacekeeping forces only for five years, which means that after five years, Azerbaijan can say, thank you, now you can leave, um, capture the last you know, small territory that Armenians still hold in Nagorno-Karabakh, and that's it, this is going to be the end of the story. I see. Um, so you mentioned a lot of different actors being implicated in this conflict. I mean, now we have Russia brokering a deal and Turkey wants to be a part of this. Um, what, why do you think Turkey is now taking a much more interest in this area? You mentioned in your article that perhaps there are some imperialist ambitions behind their actions. Could you elaborate? Of course, Susan. First of all, Turkey considered to be Turkey and Azerbaijan considered to be um, one nation, two states. 
because basically Azerbaijani people, they are Turkish people, right? And Turkey, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Turkey wanted to gain actually the control and uh, spread the so-called pan, pan Turkism over the Turkish territories, Turkish speaking territories of the former Soviet Union, which are Azerbaijan and the Central Asian states. Well, Central Asian states are more or less reluctant to have, you know, Turkish a total control because they also have the influence of China and Russia is actually very strong in the in the region. Azerbaijan, on the other hand, after Ilham Aliyev came to power in 2003, so he was being in power, he was being the president of Azerbaijan for 17 years. Um, Ilham Aliyev actually um, want to have this very close relationship with Turkey, right? Let's not forget that it's not only about the culture, it's not only about this um, ethnic closeness, right? It's also about economy, it's also about energy. As we know, Azerbaijan is an oil rich country, and uh, Turkey actually right now considered to be the transit state um, to, do, to transport hydrocarbons from Azerbaijan to, to the European market. So for Turkey, it's a very beneficial deal. And as we know, um, Russia also is not happy because of all this energy project that Azerbaijan is having with the European Union, because the main idea, the main goal of these projects is actually to have less dependency on Russian oil and gas. That's why the Turkish, the Turkish involvement in the, in the region, yes, I was talking about the imperial ambitions of Turkey, right? As I said, uh, you know, Turkey was, uh, the Ottoman Empire controlled the region at, at one time, and it was always a competition between these three empires, the Persian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Turkish Empire. So for Turkey now to have its hold actually over a very, very, all rich region um, is very beneficial. And let's not forget that Turkey is also having economic problems. Um, Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan has a very authoritative regime. So he is not as popular among the democratic, um, among the progressive part of his population. Okay, so you discussed um, Turkey's uh, imperialist ambitions in the region, um, but there's also the role of Russia. So in the last several years, Russia has had a more assertive, some would call more aggressive foreign policy, has been um, much more involved uh, in, not only in its uh, sphere of influence that it calls, but also globally. So. Do you think that Russia is kind of underplaying its role here? Shouldn't it have been much more involved in the protection of Armenia? And do you think that this overall symbolizes a shift in Russian foreign policy? Of course, Susan. So m m many scholars actually believe that in this case, Russia acted the way how it acted. So basically, Russia gave up Armenia, didn't defend Armenia, uh, because uh, Russia's position is weak. But I, I do believe that is the opposite. That at the end of the day, President Putin, he, he actually got what he always wanted to have the boots on the ground in Nagorno-Karabakh. Because look at the South Caucasus. We have um, Russian peace, so-called peacekeeping forces in Abkhazia, in South Ossetia, and now in Nagorno-Karabakh. So, of course, uh, the both countries in, in this conflict, Armenia and Azerbaijan, will continue to rely on Russia. What happened, why Russia didn't support Armenia in this conflict? First of all, there are very different theories that are going on. Some Armenian generals are actually saying that no, this is not true. Russia did provide military support. Of course, it was happening behind the scenes, but Armenia being a member of the uh, CSTO, which is the Collective Security Treatment Organization, um, 
that Russia, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and two other former Soviet Union states are a part of it, of course, Russia had to defend Armenia in this case. President Putin explained his reluctance that he is not supporting openly, I'm talking about, because as I'm saying, some uh, uh, military, uh, some Generals arguing that Russia did support Armenia. Um, President Putin's actually he uh, he explained Russia's reluctance to support Armenia as because Armenia wasn't actually the territory of the Republic of Armenia was an attack, and this security agreement is it doesn't involve um, Nagorno-Karabakh. But his statement is not true, because Armenia was attacked during this war. Azerbaijan actually attacked Bardenis, and we are talking about the city in Armenia. Azerbaijan actually attacked Rapan. More, moreover, I will say that Russian jet, Russian military jet, was shot down by the Azerbaijani army. Azerbaijan actually uh, accepted this and said that it was just a mistake. So after all of these so-called mistakes. One would assume, knowing uh, Vladimir Putin, right? Why one would assume that no, President Putin actually would uh, will behave more strongly in this case, but his reluctance to act more strongly and President. Putin during all these 45 days, he made it clear that for Russia, not only Armenia considered to be an ally, right, but Azerbaijan is a very close state. I consider it's because of the change of uh, regime in Armenia. As we know, in 2018, we had a peaceful Velvet Revolution and more progressive forces came to power. I'm talking about the uh, controversial Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, and because on the one hand he considered to be pro-Western, on the other hand, um, if he considers to be a pro-Western leader, uh, as we can see, the West also didn't support him. But on a, pro on a more personal level, Vladimir Putin had a very difficult relationship with Nikol Pashinyan because Nikol Pashinyan arrested the second president of Armenia, Robert Kocharyan, who is a very close friend of Vladimir Putin. So Putin wasn't happy with many actions of Nikol Pashinyan. He basically went uh, after the former uh, military ad administration and also the political leaders of Armenia that had a very, had a very close relation with Russia and with the Russian government. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then so, so this complicated issue here with uh, the Turkish involvement and the Russian involvement, um, when Russia was trying to broker this peace deal and uh, ceasefire recently, it didn't want Turkey to have much of a, of a part in it. And, and Turkey is trying to have, uh, you know, to be on par with Russia in the development of a, of a real agreement. Um, and this happens in other countries too, uh, in Libya also, Turkey and Russia kind of have a, both have a role there and they seem to be competing against each other in some ways. And you know, Russia trying to sell arms to Turkey and then NATO allies get worried that Turkey and Russia are getting closer. But then if we see, you know, these conflicts and both of them uh, playing a role in them, they're clearly competitors. What is your take on their relationship? Um, my thing is the following, Russia and Turkey, uh, two uh, authoritarian states ruled by two authoritarian regime, right? Uh, President Erdogan and President Putin, we can actually uh, draw similarities between these two regimes. As you mentioned, they are, um, they are part struggle in Syria, right? They're part struggle in Libya. Uh, even in Ukraine, after the annexation of Ukraine, President Erdogan wasn't happy because of the indigenous population of, of Crimea, I'm sorry, not Ukraine, of Crimea, because of the indigenous population of Tatars. So, uh, yes, on the one hand, we do have this competition that many people can assume that would not actually turn into uh, the cooperation. But I can, uh, I will say that both states, they have a very realist approach to their foreign policy, which means that all that matters for Russia or all that matters for Turkey is not their allies, but is the state's interests. And that's it. 
So in this case, it was clear actually that the agreement was signed not between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but between Russia and Turkey. It, it went, it has the same scenario that happened in Syria. Even though, as I mentioned, many Russian officials, including the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, they are sta stating that no, Turkey is not involved. There won't be a Turkey, a, a Turkish forces um, in Nagorno-Karabakh. But I actually mentioned that, but they're saying that in Azerbaijan, Turkey is planning to form a center, a so-called center that is going to involve a peaceful resolution of Nagorno-Karabakh. What type of peaceful resolution we are talking about if Turkey was military engaged on the Azerbaijan side in this conflict? How anybody can consider Turkey to be you know, the third country, to be a peacemaker in this case? This is not clear to me. It is very clear that Turkey is very biased. You know, it takes Azerbaijan sides. And in this case, I will even go further and say that there, there were committed war crimes against not only the military, not only the soldiers of Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia, but against the civil population of Nagorno-Karabakh, because if you will look now at the pictures or at the videos of Stepanakert or other cities, villages of Nagorno-Karabakh, they are all in ruins. Mm -hmm. um, so if I will actually analyze Turkey and Russian um, relations in this case, right, I would say that they both got what they wanted. I do believe that it was actually, as I say, it was a deal, a, an agreement signed between President Erdogan and President Putin. Let me provide some facts in order to actually, you know, support my argument. Um, and I would say about the fall of Shushi, um, you can watch the video of Russian journalists, military journalists that way in the area. So you will have actually the third parties um, reports, not only my words. And they are saying that uh, Shushi in Shushi, Shushi wasn't captured. Shushi was basically given to Azerbaijan. Um, and it is clear that it's something that was done with the involvement of Turkey. And do you think that the international community is largely absent from this conflict? I mean, should they be playing a much larger role? For example, we have the United Nations mandate, responsibility to protect. I know that you mentioned that uh, in your article. Um, so why aren't they present and should they do more? Yes, Susan, absolutely. The international community was absolutely absent in this conflict. Of course, the United Nations, the European Union and France and you know, individual countries, they all raised their, uh, their concerns about this conflict. They, uh, the United States and France, they brokered two ceasefires which were violated within the minutes after signing the deal, right? But um, mostly when we're talking about the United States, we know that the United States do not have a leading role now in many conflicts, in, but the South Caucasus, we have to talk about the geographic proximity, right? So the South Caucasus, one would imagine it actually would be more a more concern to the European Union member states, right? To the European Union. As I mentioned, European Union has a special initiative, the Eastern Partnership Initiative. But in the meantime, I, unfortunately, the European Union, the international community has also a very realist approach to this conflict, right? Yes, you are right. This third pillar of the responsibility to protect could be involved in this case because it talks about it's actually a tricky situation. If by international law, we consider Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is bombing its own civilian population, right? In this case, the United Nations could involve the third pillar, which means that when the country cannot protect its own, it, its own citizens, the international community has to, use, has, has to use the force and protect the civilians, right? In this case, it didn't happen because we are talking about, you know, the civilian population that were affected in this case, it didn't happen.
So it mostly because the international community in all the cases when we have, you know, the engagement of international community in, in you know, in ethnic conflicts, there should be some type of interests, either the geographic proximity of the conflict, right, to major powers, we're talking about the United Nations Security Council with uh, five permanent members who have the veto power, Russia, China, the United States, the UK, and France. So basically, as I mentioned, France, yes, France broker a deal. The UK has energy, has commercial interests with Azerbaijan. Recently, it was actually the new uh, transatlantic uh, pipeline uh, uh, the uh, the new transatlantic pipeline agreement that um, the UK signed, you know, with Azerbaijan, and this is the part of the larger um, South um, Southern Gas Corridor deal. So basically, you know, uh, the European Union or the UK they have commercial interests in the area. Mm -hmm. So that's why they were afraid that Armenia would start bombing gas power plants within Azerbaijan, which didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this conflict is very symbolic of, um, you know, power dynamics and maybe possibly power shifts. And uh, one of the main themes of this video podcast series is the, uh, the discussion on great power competition and the influence of great powers in the world. Uh, many have said that the influence of the U.S. and the West at large is waning and that the influence of China and Russia are increasing. And so in your article, uh, you briefly mentioned um, the greater Middle East and how this uh, conflict, um, you know, is implicated in the power balances in this region. And I, and I wanted to ask your opinion about how you think the power balance might shift in the greater Middle East in the coming years. And if that, in your opinion, affects the standing of the United States in the world. Of course, Susan, of course. We, in this conflict and the Middle Eastern conflict, it showed that the United States, uh, at least uh, I'm talking about for now, is not willing to take a more assertive role, right, in this conflict. But on the other hand, we have Turkey and we have Russia, China is not a military power, right? China is using its soft power and China is expanding, you know, its economic powers in this case, but still we're talking about the Shanghai Cooperation Initiative that China is, you know, has in, in, this, in this area, right? We're talking about the Bell and Road Initiative, also with the involvement of the Central Asian countries. But the rise of Turkey and Russia was always historically a key player, a major player in this region and in the Middle East. Turkey also, right? But the rise of Turkey in the South Caucasus is actually very alarming. Why? Because what this conflict showed, it showed that the authoritarian regimes, they are willing to team up with the friendly authoritarian regime, I'm talking about Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Russia, against a more democratic regime, which we have in Armenia. Mm -hmm. So this is a very, this has to actually create a real concern, not only for the European Union, but also for the United States, because the promotion of democracy in the former Soviet Union was one of the foreign policy initiatives um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, right? Because, you know, the more democratic states are, the more unwilling they are going to war with each other, as we can see happening in Western Europe, for instance. And look what's happening in, in uh, Eastern Europe. So I do believe that the promotion of democracy, I do believe that it will actually make this region more secure. On the other hand, if the United States and uh, the European Union are willing to be more absent in the region, we will have, you know, a more assertive foreign policies of Turkey, of Russia, China economically, of course, it's, it's very engaged, right, in the region as well. Iran also, um, Iran's role in this conflict was very st strange because, not strange, but this understanding, because in the past, Iran supported Armenia. But this time, the Iranian government actually, the main statement was, yes, we want to end the conflict, but in the meantime, we are supporting the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. 
Of course, we're talking about the power shift in this case. As I say, if Russia, the European Union, and if we're talking about the great game, right, it was the involvement of Russia, Britain, Turkey, in the in, in the Caspian in the Caspian Sea region. So this conflict actually shift the power towards Turkey. Ankara is becoming a very key player, which is very concerning, taking into account, you know, assertive foreign policies and expansionist ambitions of President Erdogan's government. Exactly. And Turkey is part of the NATO alliance and has often created some problems uh, within the alliance. Uh, nevertheless, it's a strategic partner in a strategic region, anchors the, you know, the um, southern uh, flank of the alliance. And um, so how do you think that Turkey's behavior uh, affects the alliance? And it often behaves in independent ways. And does it risk to pose a geostrategic complication for the alliance? Oh, certainly, so, so, certainly, because as we know, Turkey's, Turkey, Turkey's behavior in the Eastern Mediterranean, right, was causing um, problems for, for its NATO allies, including, you know, Greece and including France. And Turkey was always a troublemaker within NATO because Turkey was uh, recently purchased these military um, planes from Russia that the United States wasn't happy. But still, as we can see, Turkey does what it wants to do, what it wants to do, without even taking into consideration um, its its actually, you know, uh, obligations, right, within NATO. Um, how is going to affect NATO? I think that is going to affect NATO in many ways because, as I say, if two, if um, the Erdogan's government has problems, right? If uh, with with France, if Erdogan's government has has problems, cre creates problems with Greece, how we can talk about the collective action? What actually, you know, the these uh, member states supposed to have within NATO? is going to be, and we know that, as I said, the United States is not um, in, withdrew from many conflicts, right? So the, the United States role within NATO is also um, warning, right? So we can see that Turkey is becoming a very aggressive, but also a very active player, not only in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, in the Middle East, in the South Caucasus, in Eastern Europe, but also within NATO, which is uh, actually, yes, it is a clear power shift. Yes, and uh, for any alliance to be strong, it should be unified. And uh, often there's, there's this problem of complete uh, unity or threat perception within the alliance and it can create some geostrategic weaknesses. But at the same time, it's a necessary ally, uh, especially in the Black Sea region nowadays where um, Russia, for example, has upped its presence, uh, seized the port of Sebastopol and has a direct access to the Eastern Mediterranean. So we have three states there, part of NATO. And, um, you know, Turkey is, a, is what the second largest military in the alliance. So um, you can see why the alliance, you know, wants to have it there despite its um, independent actions. So last, but certainly not least, because this is a huge topic, especially with this conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, is there evidence of disinformation or misinformation about the ongoing conflict? And if so, what are these messages and by whom are they sent? Oh, definitely, Susan. As we talk about, there are both disinformation and misinformation, right? Um, coming also from both sides, first of all, Turkey and Azerbaijan launched a large disinformation campaign, um, even information warfare against Armenia. And I'm not talking about the involvement of the Turkish TV, right, or radio stations or Azerbaijani TV and radio stations, but I'm also talking about the social media. Armenians were portrayed as aggressors 
issues in this case, as I already mentioned, um, Armenia didn't want to break the status quo of Nagorno-Karabakh, so it's it's uh, uh, obviously that the main aggressor was Azerbaijan. Armenia was uh, painted as a great, Armenia was painted as the country who was attacked in the civil population of Azerbaijani city Ganja, which didn't happen because Azerb Armenia targeted only military positions in Ganja. Um, so in this case, Armenia was painted as, as an aggressor. On the other hand, I would like to mention about the Armenian uh, officials' misinformation that was given not only to the world, but also to its, its own population. During all these 45 years, the Ar Armenian government was presented that we are winning the war. First of all, I wanna make it clear that I'm against, I was against the war all the time. I teach diplomacy and I do believe that the Armenia and Azerbaijan could achieve compromise during all these years. I'm talking about the Madras principles, right? So you cannot have a zero sum gain in diplomacy. Azerbaijan had to gain, you know, these seven regions in return to Nagorno-Karabakh uh, status quo. So it was a perfect, you know, situation, a win-win situation from both sides. So I'm, I'm against the war, but during these all 45 days, the Armenian government was misinforming its own citizens. Of course, if, as you know very well, um, any government when it's at war, it has to, you know, misinform the war, right? And present itself that is winning the war. Of course, it's a psychological pressure to the enemy. It's very understandable. But one of the Armenian generals recently, he said that instead of just misinforming the, the uh, misinforming the population and providing 30% of misinformation, the Armenian government provided 100% of mispopulation. So all these 45 days, we thought that we are winning the war. So at the end, when Nicole Pashinyan signed this, this deal, this very unfair deal, I would mention, because it is unfair on every level. Um, the whole entire country, I'm talking about Armenia, and I'm talking about the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, and the whole world, we were all shocked. So this disinformation of Azerbaijan is actually, um, a, 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 how this disinformation, you might ask me, right? How this informational warfare affects um, the peace in general? It creates a very negative picture of the enemy. This is very dangerous what, what actually the governments are, are doing. And I'm, I'm talking about, and I would like to mention, this is very important actually. This is very important when we are talking about war crimes. I would like to mention that now, after you know signing this deal, suddenly the international community, every single country, including Russia, they suddenly forgot that Azerbaijan and Turkey they committed war crimes against Armenians. Um, Armenian soldiers were beheaded, were tortured, were executed, and the, these videos were recorded and posted on Twitter on Instagram and on other social media accounts. So this is something that I would like, you know, to raise an awareness that social media has to be responsible, you know, to see what it, it, it has to be there. But in the meantime, um, this is a very dangerous precedent, a very dangerous, because we saw it's the same style that the Islamic State, right, was using social media in order to spread terror. This is the same thing that uh, the Azerbaijani government and Turkish government was doing in this war. Yes, it's just very tricky uh, these days with, um, you know, social media and technology. You can basically, you know, invent or, you know, just put a person saying this is uh, what this person said. And it's a fake person with a fake voice, but it's uh, intended to to make people believe that that's exactly what happened. And as you as you correctly said, social media companies need to be responsible and they need to filter this information, make sure it's real somehow, because otherwise it's, as you said, it's just, it's very dangerous and sets a very dangerous precedent. 
So Lilia, thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge on this conflict. That was a fascinating conversation. I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience will as well. Thank you very much for inviting me, Susan. I appreciate that. Thank you. And to the audience, thanks again, of course, for tuning in to Security in the 21st Century.